Hi, welcome everyone and a special welcome to the third graders from the Eddy School who at this time of year come and visit the Higgins Farm windmill. We are so glad to have you here to visit this gorgeous old mill which was you probably didn't know but this windmill has not been here always. It's in the beginning it was on 6A going towards Orleans. It was close to the road and it frightened the horses. So they had to move it. They moved the mill down Ellis Landing closer to the beach, which was then on the Nickerson property, now Ocean Edge. And in 1974, the Brewster Historical Society moved and restored the mill to this location. Uh, this property belongs to the Brewster Historical Society and the Brewster Historical Society maintains the mill, the forge, another is important element in every town in 1795. And in the back we have the Harris Black House, which at one time had nine children and three generations living in it. So someday you'll be able to come and walk through the whole property on your own or with a free tour guide and the best way to find out about that is to go to www.roosterhistoricalsocietywebsite.org and it will tell you about experiences and under that heading you will find the hours that the mill and the forge are open. Very often the forge is running so I, I hope you'll come again but today we have a special tour and it's going to be videoed and you're going to be the farmers and you're going to be holding your flower and I'm going to be the miller. Do I look like a miller? I don't think so. The miller was a man. He was probably short because everybody was short and he was extraordinarily strong and smart. So how old do you think this mill is? I'm going to tell you 225 years old. It, it shown on a map that was published in 1795 so we know that the mill dates at least to 1795. Guess what? George Washington was president. Brewster looked so different in 1795 because there were no trees. There were no trees anywhere because the settlers had to cut the trees to build their houses, make wagons, and to clear the land to grow corn and vegetables to feed themselves and animals. There were no stores. If you needed a quart of milk, you got a cow and you milked the cow for a quart of milk. There were no restaurants. Nobody went out for a hamburger. So it was very different in those days. So now you've been good farmers, standing in line, first come, first serve, is what the miller would say. So then the first person who arrived would stand first, and then after that. Um, look at the mill, it's made of wood. Guess where that wood came from? Maine. It's not, it's not local wood. And there are stones inside that are a very important element of the mill. They came from New York. So the very first thing the miller had to do while everybody was waiting was put the canvas on the arms of the mill. And these are the arms. He would pull each arm down and he would climb it and starting at the top he would tie canvas to the, to the back and then to the front. And he'd do one, two, three, four. He'd do all four while everybody waited. And if he only did three, guess what? He was three sheets to the wind. So that meant somebody was drunk. And you don't want a drunk windmill because it would be all cockeyed. It's important to have all four. So let's walk over here. This, the second thing, after putting the canvas on the arms, he had to do something else. The second most important thing that the miller has to do before anybody can, any of the farmers can come in with their corn is he has to get that cap. See that roof on top of the windmill? See how it, it stands? It's um, extremely heavy. There are no nails holding it there. It's held of its own weight and this pole running through it. And the object is to be able to move the cap and he does it by putting his shoulder to the wheel. 
The second most important thing that the miller does is get that the arms into the wind. And the way he does that is he has to have an ox. That me meant he had some money or some friends who came and helped him push. And he would push that cap. I want you to look at the mill now too, because this was new technology around 1795. This is called an English smock mill. And if you look at the way it's shaped, it's shaped so it flares out. That's, that is suppo supposedly looks like a painter's smock, like somebody was an artist and they would wear a smock over their clothing. And the technology came from England and you needed a millwright, a very talented person uh, who knew how to build and put a windmill together. So, so he's done one, he's done the, the canvas on the arms. Two, he has pushed that cap so that the arms are into the wind. Now we can go inside. Okay, so um, now we're inside. It's so beautiful in here. You definitely have to come back and smell the wood and just get a feel for this very, very old structure. So look over here, there, were, there was no glass. They, it's just an open window. And as I said, there are two stones. So this is important. There's the bottom stone, which is called the bed stone. And there's the top stone, which you'll see upstairs. And that's called the runner stone. The bed stone stays still. The runner stone, when the mill gets going, is going like that. And that is how the corn is ground. If, if you want a fine grind, it's down here. If he wants a coarse grind, he'll bring it up. And the way the miller did it was he pushed this tentering rod up and down, and that controlled the runner stone. And he would actually say to the farmers, oh, tell me what kind of grind you'd like. Would you like a grind for bread or pancakes? Or do you want a coarse grind for your animals? And he would stand here, and he would he'd be smelling the flour all the time. Because if the stones got too f close, the flour would burn and it tastes terrible. If, so that was nose to the grindstone, which today means focus on your job. Get your nose to the grindstone and just pay attention. Um, the other thing he did was he was feeling it, making sure he was getting the right grind as he was controlling that stone. And that's called rule of thumb. And a good rule of thumb expression today is drink eight water, glasses of water a day. That's a good rule of thumb. They're, they're, they're like maxims. But this is where the expression comes from. This is how he was always checking the grind. And believe you me, if he didn't pay attention, and don't forget, the only way he knew what, how the wind was blowing was he was looking out the store and watching the arms go around. So if there was a big gust of wind and there was no weather report, he had to control, drop the stone, he had to go out and control the canvas. And if the stones hit, if they hit, they created a spark and whoosh, this whole place went up in flames. He'd lose his mill, he'd lose his job, he could lose his life. So remember in the beginning I said he had to be smart? That's what, meant, that's what I mean by being smart. He really had to know what he was doing and he had to know how to control this tentering rod. So let's go upstairs and we, oh, before we go upstairs, I want to show you how this bedstone, this flat stone, how important it was to have it flat and immovable. If you look up here, you'll see wedges under the stone and wedges around the circle of the stone. That is to hold it still, because as I said, you get a spark in here, this flower, whew, it is very flammable. So that was so important. And when you look at those wedges, you know somebody who knew what they were doing put that stone in. The other interesting thing that you wanna look at here is this iron spindle coming down. That's also, when we go upstairs, you'll see the rest of it. That's controlling the top stone. And this is the big trestle that's holding the stones that moves up and down when, he, when the miller uses the tentering rod. It's complicated. It's, it's, it's really high tech. Okay, um, let's go upstairs.
<laughs> on this special day, I'm going to allow the farmers in because I want you to see how the windmill runs. So remember, we looked at the heavy cap outside that has the pole coming through. Um, you can see the light that that comes through it just shows you how this cap is just sitting there of its own weight and beneath that you can see black stains and those black stains are animal fat that's what they use to grease the cap so it would turn easily so they didn't have petroleum they had no petroleum oil or grease they used animal fat for the grease so uh I think it's just so interesting that the cap is such an element, such a strong element of the whole mill operation. Normally the miller would keep the farmers outside until he had everything in, in operation. But wait till you see this. See that box up there that's on an arm going outside? That box has rocks in it. And the miller would clamber up there and when he took the rocks out, whoa, the whole thing started to go clickety-clack, clickety-clack, clickety-clack because this giant brake wheel is turning because the wind has caught the arms outside. Remember, we put the, the Miller put the arms into the wind and now this giant brake wheel with 60 cogs on it is turning. And as that brake wheel turns, those cogs are catching into this, what's called a wallower, and it has 13 spaces. So the wallower turns, the brake wheel, the arms are turning, the brake wheel turns, the wallower turns, the wind shaft, called a quant, turns, and this iron rod goes down it goes through the runner stone and it has spikes coming out of it and that's causing th the top stone to turn so when all that is going amazing how the wind forces the arms forces the brake wheel forces the wallower forces the wind shaft to turn this top stone around and around and this is when the farmers can come in and drop their corn into this corn hopper which goes down the chute and this and this shakes and it pushes the corn down and this is when you get to this most amazing part you want to see the grooves because you can't see the grooves in the stone these are not willy-nilly grooves. There's nothing haphazard about them. This is high-tech. The millwright, not only did he have to know how to put the mill together, and he probably used men who know how to put ships together, he had to make these grooves. And these grooves, if you look close in the picture, have a special design. And what that special design did was push the flower out and then in, in some mills, maybe this one, there was a leather tab on the runner stone that would push, keep pushing the flower around till it went off. Uh, the centrifugal force would force it down the hole into the miller's bin. Once the miller had the brake wheel turning and the arms are turning and the wind is, he's got a nice 10, 50 mile an hour wind going outside. He's downstairs at the tentering rod controlling this runner stone. He says to the farmers, okay, you're allowed upstairs and you bring your corn and drop it into this hopper. And when it drops into the hopper, it goes down the shoe, which shakes. This is how the miller got paid. It was a very good job to be a miller. In a, I think you got a house. And he, the way he got paid is he kept back some. It was called his pottle, P-O-T-T-L-E. That's his pottle. He kept it in here. And on days when they couldn't grind corn or um, it was too windy, it's too, too still like today, he could sell that flour and he could bother that flour. So it was, he, 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 he did very well. And 
This is the inside of it. They, not only did the farmer keep his pottle, it looked like a mouse might have kept his pottle. So um, well, there was lots of wildlife sharing the windmill with the miller. And on boring days, um, he would carve ships, tall ships, which you can see on the top of this bin. And there are photographs there that might be easier to see. You know, once a week, the, f the miller had to uh, clean the stones. And about once a month, the millwright, the famous millwright who probably traveled around, came to shop in the stone. So the first thing that had to happen when they were going to take the stone out was they had to take all the wooden casing off and the hopper. I mean, they had to take this all apart. They had to get the the spindle out. And then, look at this. This is truly amazing. Now, keep in mind, all the this iron work was done in a blacksmith shop. The blacksmith made the, all the tools for farming, for cooking. You know, you always see the women over the fire with the big black pot that would be made at a blacksmith shop. All this was made at a blacksmith shop. This was made with saws. They did. You know, it, it was very elementary compared to what we have today. So you see, see a rod, an iron rod would go through this loop and then it would go through the side of that runner stone. And there's a hole on the side of the stone and the rod would run right through a hole on the other side. So keep in mind, everything's taken away. And then this stone weighs one and a half tons. Some strong men in the miller would pick it up. And look what's happened here. They obviously put this in and then discovered the stone was too big. So they had to carve it away. And look here, we have a trap door. The trap door was to allow the stone to flip because the ceiling was too low. This ceiling has in fact been raised. When Mrs. Nickerson had this on her property, she used this mill for a clubhouse. They had a little golf course and this was the clubhouse. So she raised the roof because, you know, by the 20th century, everybody was much taller. So, um, so anyway, so this crane, this amazing piece of equipment, would move the stone and then they would flip it and clean it and sharpen it. And then they would also have to get that, that bottom stone out, the bed stone, and clean and sharpen that. So that, I'm sure that took all day. So, so when the mill wasn't running because of weather, there was plenty to do to keep this mill in good condition. They, they had what they needed to make bread, pancakes, or to feed their animals. But it was a hard job. You didn't run to the supermarket and get a loaf of bread. You came here and that miller took care of you. So let's go downstairs. I want you to have another look at that tentering rod. So while you farmers are upstairs dropping your corn down the chute, it's coming down this chute and this is where, again, I, the miller has his nose to the grindstone and rule of thumb. And he has this that is scooping the flour because I told you, you don't want it to get hot. So he's doing this, he's doing this, and he's doing this, watching, making sure that that top stone doesn't get too close to the bottom stone, that the runner stone doesn't get too close to the bed stone. To, to, um, to, to take a break, he would let the top stone fly up. He knew how to do that, separate it. And he would give the farmers their flour out this handy little chute. Isn't that ingenious? The whole thing is ingenious. Um, so in 1898, Someone wrote a poem which you can barely see, but your old mill, your dear arms seem to stretch out in loving embrace to me. December 26, 1898. You have been amazing farmers, and I hope you're happy with the grind that you got for your corn. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week or the week after whenever we have a good day for grinding. So when you're ready to make a, to come to uh, the Brewster Historical Society site, 
What you should do is go online to www.brewsterhistoricalsociety.org and look under experiences. And under experiences, you'll find the times and days that the mill, the forge, and the uh, Harris Black House will be opened. Also, there'll be lots of information about the Elijah Cobb House, which you'll also want to visit. So um, do pay attention to what's on the website. And thank you for joining me on this virtual tour of the Higgins Farm Windmill built in 1795 or earlier. And um, aren't we lucky to have it in this beautiful site in Brewster. Thank you again. Bye.